Good to go. There we go. Well, that's the first one. These are my disclosures. That is actually my picture as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so by way of introduction, my topics for presentation are, are, are stratified into two categories here. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the pertinent biomechanical properties of the lumbar pelvic spine. And these are, are stratified a little further into the lumbar sacral regions, as well as the sacroiliac region. So I'll spend a little bit more time on that because I think that's really the crux of the matter and, and, and uh, the, the area of focus for this particular talk. And then as a secondary topic, I'd like to provide a, a comparative review of instrumentation techniques and introduce what I consider or highlight what I consider to be four key principles associated with lumbar pelvic fixation. Uh, the first of all are being the anatomic zones of fixation that are available uh, in the lumbar pelvic region. And the remaining three that I'm going to bring up are really a springboard from those anatomic zones. So as I show these, I want you to, we're going to be coming back to zone one, zone two, zone three. I'll go into each of these a little bit, but uh, consider the next three uh, more or less a springboard from this one. Uh, the second being uh, the variability in bone mineral density in the sacroiliac region and the regional variability in that, particularly as we transition from the S1 to the S2 level. The third area has to do with implant fixation. And again, these are principles of lumbar pelvic fixation. So we're looking at screw orientation, screw dimensions, that could be length of the screw, diameter of the screw, and whether or not cortical purchase is obtained. Uh, so this is to be the implant fixation. And finally, finally, we'll look at implant kinematics, specifically incorporating the instrumentation with the longitudinal member and how various fixation uh, methods across these different zones, be them one, two, and three, influence the overall kinematic properties of the reconstruction. Uh, so to begin with, the biomechanics of the lumbar pelvic region represents a very formidable kinematic transition zone. A transition zone in that a highly mobile lumbar region is juxtaposed to a nearly immobile sacroiliac region. And the bar chart to the left uh, documents lumbar pelvic range of motion comparing three studies under uh, three predominant loading classifications, flexion extension, lateral bending, axial rotation. I don't wanna to get too much in the minutia of these studies. These are all very good studies, but the take home message and what I'd like to point out is here in the lumbar spine as we transition from the L1-2 level to the lumbar sacral junction, you can appreciate the, the average range of motions that are occurring in the non-degenerated disc, typically in rotation around three to four degrees and then up to flexion extension, somewhere between eight and as high as 15 or 16 degrees. But importantly, as we transition to the S1, uh, the sacroiliac junction, you can appreciate the significant decrease in the range of motion. We're looking at 0.5 to about two degrees of motion this is actually reaching the limitation of our optoelectronic tracking systems to figure out the, the actual range of motions and translations that are occurring at this particular site. So in, in summary of this, as we transition from the lumbar spine into the pelvis via the SIJ, we're, we're posed with a very significant kinematic transition zone. And all these, although these loads, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, all these motions are reduced, importantly, the, the, the uh, excuse me, there we go, the load transmission doesn't really change. The axial load in the lower lumbar spine has been well documented. It's about 60% of the total body weight. 80% of that transmitted through the anterior middle columns and the remaining 20% through the posterior column. Now this of course can change based on degeneration of the tree, of tree joint complex, but importantly, this is more or less what it looks like in the non-degenerative state. Anterior posterior shear, uh, this is the real crux of the, and might be the consideration in terms of low transmission. It normally is about 250 to 500 newtons in the lower lumbar spine. So this is the, the actual shear of one facet at four on five against the other. Uh, and depending on the degree of degeneration, this can increase significantly as shown. Uh, in addition to that, lumbar torque, uh, excuse me, AP shear forces tend to increase under high PIs as well as uh, sacral slope. So we can anticipate a higher incidence of global sagittal imbalance with that. And likewise, a positive shift in the SVA 
contributes to increased lumbar torque, sacral compression, as well as AP shear. So in summary, when we're considering the biomechanics of the lumbar pelvic spine, we're, we're entering a transition zone. It's a formidable biomechanical environment for what I consider to be success or even survivorship of lumbar pelvic spinal instrumentation and really provides a basis for many of the instrumentation related complications that many of the, the panelists here have seen. And I'm sure some of you folks have seen that are, that are viewing this. It could be screw pull out, screw plow through, rod fracture, screw fracture, all of these things. So we have a very formidable environment that we're dealing with, probably one of the most complex in the axial skeleton from a reconstruction standpoint. So on to these principles of lumbar pelvic fixation. The first was de described by O'Brien in 2004. These are the zones of sacral pelvic fixation. I won't spend too much time on this. We have zone one, which is the S1 vertebral body and the self-led margins of the sacral alo. We transition to two, which works uh, inferiorly on the margins of the ala and regions inferior to S2 as shown here. And then zone three being the iliac wings bilaterally. I tend to think that this uh, the O'Brien uh, classification as shown here was a bit of a, a springboard from uh, Dr. Dave McCord's early work in 92 on the concept of the pivot point, which I'll come back to. Uh, but what we'll see, and, and just keep this in mind as we go through things, is that implant fixation tends to improve as we move from zones one into zones three. And uh, particularly as viewed in the sagittal plane, when we move anterior to this middle osteoligomenous column at the lumbosacral junction, we'll see the, in, the actual uh, flexural stiffness and overall uh, efficacy of the instrumentation will improve. Uh, the second area or principle that I like to talk about is bone mineral density. There's a very nice study by Drs. Polly and Hull. Uh, it's published in 16, looking at the S1 vertebral bone mineral density. This is based on 108 patients, uh, looking at the average CT attenuation using the L1 vertebral body as a control. And they looked at the regional bone mineral density uh, throughout the uh, S1 level. And of particular interest, uh, a little difficult for me to see my screen here. The central ala, as well as the uh, lateral regions, as shown here and highlighted, demonstrated a marked decrease compared to the uh, L1 vertebral body. Now, again, this is the control in the same patient, but it's a very significant decrease. So almost a haloing effect here at the S1 level, whereas the S1 vertebral body, uh, either anteriorly, as well as along the midline and superior end plate, had a significant increase over the L1 vertebral body. So if one were considering fixation or trying to optimize fixation at the L1 level, or excuse me, the S1 level, we would think about anterior medial angulation of our screws. We would think about the possible purchase of the uh, superior uh, vertebral end plate at S1 and possibly the sacral promontory, all of which have higher BMDs than uh, the other regions. Likewise, Salazar, in a follow-up to this, did a, a vertebral bone mineral density assessment of S2, and he normalized it to S1, which was in difference to Dave Polly's study. Now, this was based on a fewer number of patients, only 25, but again, using uh, CT scans and regional BMD and Helmsfeld units. And what he found, if, if you look to the, the bar chart on the right, 100% represents the BMD occurring at the S1 level. And he found that the S2 anterior region had the highest BMD, but interestingly, we, interestingly was significantly less than the S1 BMD. So even though it's uh, <clears throat> the same vertebral element or essentially uh, just one lower, there was a significant decrease. And likewise, as we moved into the uh, right anterior, right uh, left anterior, as well as the posterior regions of S2, there was a very significant decrease compared to S1. So clearly S2 uh, is not the optimal location. And I believe that Dr. Salazar even concluded in his paper that probably some type of iliosacral fixation or something being incorporated a cortex outside of the S2 cortex uh, is indicated if we were to use fixation at this region. 
So here we're going to transition into some of the implant fixation biomechanical properties. And this would be the third principle that I would uh, consider in lumbar pelvic instrumentation. And I'm going to go through this, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of zones. So this is zone one, looking at S1 sacral screws alone. One of the key uh, findings here and observations and well-documented is the concept of triangulation. Uh, this stems way back to um, <clears throat> probably three decades plus, Drs. Gaines, Drs. Carson, Drs. Asher, Dr. Steffi, all these individuals really uh, were proponents of the concept of triangulation of instrumentation, particularly in the lower lumbar spine. We found in some early studies that we could increase the pullout force by twofold with a, you know, around 25 to 30 degrees of angulation of screws with a, a, a transverse loader cross connector uh, as shown here. And by the way, this is one of the first cross connectors to buy, uh, design. This was by Dr. Art Steffi back in uh, 1989. The second area, and this is a very nice study by uh, Dr. Ron Lehman, looked at the maximal insertional torque comparing bicortical versus tricortical fixation. I think it's a bit of an ingenious study the way he did this. Um, but the take home message to begin with is that the average peak torque on insertion is about twofold if we employ a tricortical technique versus bicortical. And what he did is he actually had a torque meter and he looked at the uh, torque as a function of screw revolution. And he found that at about the sixth turn, when having a trajectory of a bicortical nature versus tricortical, and about the sixth turn in, originating, of course, on the posterior aspect of, of S1, there was a significant increase in the, uh, the insertional torque. And this continued all the way up and through his purchase of the uh, sacral promontory. And it's about a twofold increase as you can appreciate. So clearly, tricortical fixation, if you're going to get into the S1 area uh, and, it's, and it's clinically available, tricortical fixation and then purchase of that promontory is biomechanically advantageous. And a follow-up to this study, Gregorian et al. did a similar study, but what they looked at were pull-out strengths of bicortical screw fixation versus screws which penetrated the vertebral end plate. And the take home message here was that those that captured two cortices, uh, particularly the vertebral end plate, which you'll remember had a higher BMD uh, than a little bit lower in the S1 uh, vertebral element, had a higher pullout strength. So if it is clinically indicated, there is an opportunity to capture that vertebral end plate and improve fixation. And the last thing I want to talk about, and this could be a whole lecture in itself for probably two hours, is the concept of structural anterior column support. Again, working at the uh, in zone one, the S1 sacral screw. This is some work done at our lab. I had an opportunity to work with Dr. Keith Bridwell on this. And this bar chart really highlights some very interesting findings as it relates to protection of the S1 screw. You see a lot of S1 screw failures, as you know, as well as rod failures. And our question was, what was, how could we minimize the screw strain actually occurring here? And this bar chart is shown here, demonstrates the, uh, the S1 screw strain under anterior flexion and with increasing levels of transpedicular screw fixation. So as we add screws from L5 and we proceed approximately up to L1, and the, the inner body space is not protected with pedicle screws alone, you can appreciate about a two, almost threefold increase and the screw strain that occurs as we move from five to one. When we add an inner body spacer at five one, now at this time, and with this particular study, we were using femoral ring allograph, at about the L3 level, we saw a pretty, a very pronounced reduction uh, in the screw strain that it was occurring. So it's more or less plateaued. So it was very protective to have an inner body spacer. And then finally with iliac screws, these were most protective of the S1 screw. This was in the absence of a femoral ring allograph. But you can appreciate the difference in the screw strain and long segment reconstructions. You can reduce that S1 screw strain by about five-fold by having iliac screws. So they definitely reduce screw strain and certainly reduce segmental flexibility as documented in a number of studies. Uh, as a follow-up to Lehman's study, Polly did a very nice study looking at uh, the implant fixation, specifically insertional torque of iliac screws. He looked at screw orientation, 
He looked at screw uh, dimensions as well as trajectory. And the take home message on this, similar to Ron Lehman's study on insertional torque, is that larger diameter screws, as well as uh, had a significant effect on the overall insertional torque of the implant. Uh, tra the trajectory of the screw, be it to the superior acetabular rim or the anterior inferior iliac spine, did not have an effect on the overall insertional torque. Of particular interest, the length of the screw and the penetration of the screw did have a very significant effect on insertional torque. And I wanted to include one additional slide here from Dave's presentation. I think this is a great way to show it. This is the actual, you can see the long axis of the screw here, the length on the x-axis of the screw, and then the insertional torque on the y-axis. You can appreciate once he hit about 80 millimeters of depth, the overall insertional torque tended to increase significantly and up to about twofold. Now, this is a fairly long screw, and I'd love to hear from some of the clinicians in the group after this whether or not you'd be comfortable putting in you know, a 12 centimeter screw or not. Uh, I know here at, at our hospital, they're usually using nine to 10 centimeter screws, but putting in a 12 or 14, I don't know that that's exactly something that one would wanna uh, try to do, but certainly interested in opinions on that. So the final uh, principle associated with lumbar pelvic fixation is that of implant kinematics. So now we're transitioning from the individual screw fixation techniques. It doesn't have cortex uh, involved with it. Is it a, in a, re a region of higher bone mineral density? Those sorts of things to the overall multi-segmental flexibility properties of it. And then we're going to transition back to zone one. So now we're just looking at screw fixation at zone one. Uh, this is a study from our lab. I think probably to date, it's the largest compilation of lumbopelvic instrumentation done. Uh, it's a total of, we're actually now up to 50 lumbopelvic spines, 25 males, 25 females. And there are two take home points here that I'd like to point out. Uh, the first is that just looking at the intact spine kinematics under the three predominant loading classifications, flexion, extension, lateral bending and rotation, uh, we had an equal division of females and males, and of particular interest in each case under each loading modality for the intact spine, the females had higher ranges of motion under all three loading modes, and sometimes almost threefold compared to the males. When we added S1 screws to that, of course, the range of motion at the SIJ increased uh, proportionally, but in, in, in similarity to the intact spine, uh, the females demonstrated greater ranges of motion with S1 fixation alone. So this is zone one. We have not gone into the iliac wing. This is just the kinematics of the SIJ with instrumentation to the S1 level. So uh, in terms of, now we're gonna transition to zone three. I'm gonna bypass zone two because <laughs> we really don't use a lot of S2 screws in, in, in our research work. But so I'd like to focus on zone three because this is where I tend to get most of the questions. Uh, this is a, a compilation of various studies and I'm uh, looking at the multi-directional flexibility properties of iliac screws. And I think across the board, and, and this is maybe 30 plus uh, references that I could go through here, the use of iliac screws definitely increased stiffness, stiffness at the L5 S1 junction as expected. And under anterior flexural load to failure methods, uh, they increase the peak moment at construct failure. So clearly iliac screws do offer, have a biomechanical advantage uh, when utilized. The next question I'm often posed with and probably more frequently, well, how, does, how do iliac screws compare to the S2AI screws in terms of multi-directional flexibility? I did a comprehensive lit search on this, so looking at over 30 publications from PubMed and uh, I'd be happy to talk with anyone that wants to about this, but I couldn't find any significant differences in the multi-directional flexibility properties between the two techniques. And likewise, no significant differences at the peak moment and construct failure. And again, this is based on a, on a wide variety of biomechanical studies, including many of our own. This happens to be one of those. They had the opportunity to work with Dr. Paul Sponseller at Hopkins. And we looked at a variety of things here, S1, S2 fixation, S2 AI. We also looked at unilateral and bilateral iliac screw fixation. 
And the take home message here really is, is that we couldn't see any differences across the board. This was pre and post fatigue. So we put these in, we cycled them for, uh, I believe this is 20,000 cycles. And we couldn't find any differences between an S2AI, unilateral or bilateral. Of particular interest, and as expected, and this is the SIJ kinematics, um, when we had just implanted S1 and S2 screws, we saw an increased uh, range of motion at the SIJ under flexion extension loading. So this just happens to be one example of the iliac screws versus the S2 AI. Probably the most comprehensive study I've seen to date is that by Dave McCord. This is back in 92. I had to be uh, the opportunity of working on this study with Dave, he was one of our fellows. I don't think it's been replicated since simply because we use so many specimens. We had 66 uh, calf spines uh, and we evaluated 10 different reconstruction methods. And again, I'd like to point out uh, some of these were uh, included zone three, some zone two and zone one. So there were 10 different reconstruction methods and you can appreciate maybe some of the younger folks in the audience are, are not familiar with the terms of the Galveston technique, but that's what we used with rods, iliac screws. We used some of the uh, older CD instrumentation uh, for the S12 fixation, and then S1 along uh, looking at uh, the, what was called the Steffi plate or VSP, um, also Bluki and as well as Harrington reconstructions. And the take home message of course here is that those implants which incorporated the zone three being the iliac wing demonstrated the highest in, uh, moment at uh, failure compared to those at zone two and zone one. The addition of the S2 fixation screw really didn't add that much, about 20%, which was quite surprising to Dr. Mark Asher at the time. He felt that that was uh, that and as well as a sacral hook would be very beneficial. But in our testing, we found it not to be uh, as beneficial. And as a result of this work, uh, Dave McCord introduced the concept of the pivot point. It's fairly well documented. And it's based on the idea that fixation anterior to the middle osteoligomenous column as viewed in the sagittal plane increases the overall stabilization of the reconstruction. And he um, created what, was, what I would call continuum of fixation stabilization, those being uh, implants that capture just zone one. So this would be a zone one screw. This is the middle osteoligomenous column. Although going anterior to it, not quite as far as you're gonna see in zone uh, two and more importantly, zone three, where we're getting into S2AI fixation as well as iliac fixation. So instrumentation which proceeds anterior to this MOC, middle osteoligomenous column, demonstrated the highest level maximum moment at failure. So in summary, lumbopelvic, the lumbopelvic jump junction certainly represents a very formidable kinematic transition zone uh, for the success of spinal instrumentation. Uh, when thinking about instrumentation, often consider these four points, one being the zones of pelvic fixation that are available, uh, how bone mineral density changes throughout these various zones, uh, the in orientation of instrumentation as well as whether or not cortical purchase is obtained, and whether or not, if you are instrumenting the iliac wing, uh, you want to proceed or project that instrumentation anterior to the pivot point or the MOC, this seems to improve the overall stabilization. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Super insights. Thank you, Brian, for applauding you. <laughs> The body of work is amazing. And again, I, I hope that uh, many people online will download your work because it is that uh, fundamentally important and uh, covers a lot of bases. So let me just hit a couple of very select high points. Uh, a couple of manufacturers hit so-called cortical screws as the new nirvana of hard replacement to allegedly have, quote, less invasiveness. Again, I'm on the theme of David Skaggs earlier today. What are your biomechanical thoughts on cortical screws versus conventional well-placed pedicle screws? So I think the advantage of cortical screws, I'm gonna answer this and I'm gonna have Dr. Sanser stand up and comment as well. We have a publication together on that. And cortical screws I think are, are indicated and, and biomechanically advantageous, uh, particularly in the osteopenic patient and particularly at the L4, L5 uh, level. Uh, we had difficulty, we put these in at L2 and L3 and we compared them to traditional uh, pedicle screws. Uh, 
we really didn't see any difference there. But in the osteopenic patient, when you looked at the actual surface area contact of a pedicle screw at L4 and L5 versus a cortical screw, it's probably a four or five fold difference, but we found equivalency in terms of the pullout strength with them at four and five. So I think they're certainly indicated in the osteopenic patient and they're indicated at the L4, L5 level. Charlie, what do you think? Yeah, that, I think that was a, a very important study that we did because essentially a well-placed pedicle screw in the upper lumbar spine for all intents and purposes is a very strong cortical screw because you're engaging the cortex of the pedicle um, if you put in like a 5.5 screw in the middle of L5, which has a very wide pedicle, uh, that may not necessarily be as strong in an osteoporotic patient as a well-positioned cortical screw that takes advantage of the cortical uh, aspects of that pedicle. So um, it, it really depends on the size of the pedicle. Um, and that's what that study showed. And especially this was uh, very uh, well shown in these osteoporotic specimens um, in that, that paper that we, that we did together. So um, second point is uh, iliac fixation. I was very glad to hear that you did not find any great differences between uh, what seems to have become kind of the norm, which is S2AI screws versus iliac screws. I want to shout out to uh, Cliff Pierre. Cliff gives a quick wave. He just uh, presented at the joint section of study, and I know you don't have a microphone right now, but what did you find? Just can you uh, give Cliff, what were your findings that you presented at the joint section just last uh, week? Good morning, everyone. So we did a uh, fixation study comparing the S2AI to modified iliac and traditional iliac. And again, as you noted, Dr. Cunningham, no uh, statistical difference between the different fixation techniques, which uh, for us concluded that modified iliac um, provided similar biomechanical advantages as the S2AI compared to the traditional iliac. Um, so less dissection, a medial entry point from the modified iliac perspective. And so it just really confirms all this, the things you mentioned in the recent studies. So thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Brian, for uh, kind of giving us uh, a little bandwidth as clinicians. And to answer your question, will clinicians be comfortable to put 120 millimeter screws in? I'm pretty sure that if we did a live feed to the OR, my partner, Dr. Amil Abdul-Jabbar, would be seen live putting in two, uh, sorry, uh, two pairs of 120 millimeter screws right now in a displaced uh, zone three Roykamia 3 injury or AO class C3. Uh, he, will, uh, he has a complex sacral fracture dislocation that he's fixing right now in a very osteopenic patient with very long screws. Another quick biomechanics, it's such a uh, pleasure to have you now running over time, but um, uh, talk to us about cannulated screws versus uh, straight screws. Is there a loss of biomechanical quality fixation and even out of diameter or even killed out of diameter screws by using a cannulated screw versus a solid screw, meaning that greater inner diameter and that loss of thread depth. Is that a sacrifice that we're making? Are we making a biomechanical sacrifice also in fatigue load resistance of the head of screw to shank interface? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so I think the, the cannulated screws, if there's a, a particular pitfall of cannulated screws, it's in dynamic fatigue loading and that cantilever, particularly if you're using those at the S1 level or maybe even in the iliac wing, although I haven't seen it uh, that often, uh, it, you're, you're, you're much more prone to failure with those with cannulated screws. Uh, probably the acute fixation properties of that uh, and I have not done a, a study looking at cannulated versus solid uh, screws in terms of pullout. There would be no difference, but it would be in the, in the fatigue uh, properties of the screws themselves. 